you know my feelings. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, good evening. Welcome to our first commission meeting in our new city hall, new commission chambers. This is the um, March 26, 2024 City Commission regular meeting. Um, we're very thrilled to be here. I just want to thank all of our staff for the hard work over the past week in particular in getting um, moved in. Sorry, I have to remember to talk into the mic a little bit closer. Um, it looks amazing, and we're just, it's, this has been a long time coming, so it's, it's kind of surreal to be sitting right here. So thank you all for being here in the audience, and thank you again to the staff. So if we can, we'll get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone, please stand. All right, um, our first item on the agenda um, is our swearing-in ceremony for newly elected commissioners. So as you all know, we just had an election last week, a week ago tonight. Um, but before we move into that, I just wanted to recognize Commissioner Wetzel and um, thank her for her service on for the last four years representing Sunset Beach. And just wanted to turn it over to you and if you have any parting words. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, first, I would like to acknowledge this beautiful view that we have here from these chambers, which is, um, I'm, a little, uh, I'm a little bit jealous that I didn't have this view for a while, and that this, but I am glad that I get to see it. Um, but I would like to thank the city staff, who is just amazing. Um, they are, we have such a great, just the, from the full administration here, from the top down, Everybody works so hard and always has the best interest of the city at heart. Um, all of the commissioners here do. I know that a lot of people get um, a lot of criticism and not enough kudos all the time, but um, there are so many things that go on behind the scenes that I had no idea until I was in this position, just how things are done and how they get done and how we, how we make everything run. And everybody has been absolutely, oh, I forgot to turn off my phone. Leave that, uh, that's so embarrassing. The first time in four years. Um, so the, um, but I just, uh, our staff is just, um, whether it's um, somebody picking up um, items on the beach or, you know, getting, driving those little garbage trucks on the beach to, you know, doing the most high level um, things here. It's just uh, a great, great staff to work with and, and we see how hard they work. And then um, as Gary was just pointing out, at six o'clock everybody was quiet and um, you know, where they were supposed to and everybody was as acting you know, as, as they should when a meeting starts. And I said, that's because it's Sunset Beach people here tonight. <laughs> district four people, because I always say when we have things going on that our district four people are, I mean, I, I love all of Treasure Island, don't get me wrong, but, and I, maybe I'm just a little biased, but I love our district four people so much. Um, we li we have the oppor <laughs> we have the opportunity to live in um, you know such a, a wonderful place all of Treasure Island and then we have our eclectic corner down there where um, it is uh, quite a variety of people and but I do love all of Treasure Island I, I all of the um, as as you sit here you're not just working for one neighborhood you are working for the betterment of the whole city so I really appreciate the opportunity that everyone has given me to serve you, and it has been a pleasure, it's been quite an experience, and I will miss it, so, but I'm ready to move on. <laughs> so thank you, and congratulations to Arden Dickey. I know that um, he will do a great job. All right, thank you. We'll turn it over to our city clerk, Celine, to do our swearing in.
we also had two seats that were uncontested, and so now we're, those individuals also have to be sworn in for their um, next term. Right. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations to all those that are sworn in tonight. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with the rest of our meeting. So, roll call, please. Commissioner Toth here. Commissioner Doctor here. Commissioner Minning here. Commissioner Dickey here. Mayor Payne here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have approval of regular and workshop agendas. Do we have any changes that need to be made on our agenda this evening? Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed as the agenda is, is published. Uh, we do not have any proclamations, recognitions, or cer certificates of appreciation this evening. So we'll move into public comments for non-agenda items. I have a few cards. Um, I have Terry Auerbach. Hi, everybody. Ooh. Carrie Auerbach, Treasure Island Adopt a Beach. Um, I live in St. Petersburg, and I just, I'm so excited for all of you. This is just so great. Um, the building is fantastic. I just want to remind people that April 13th, I know it's a busy day, the Community Appreciation Day is going on, um, but in the morning at 8.30 across from Waffle House, there's a special cleanup, and it's going to be a little ridiculous and a little fun and very educational. Uh, we have Trash Colin, we have Trash Wolf, if you've never seen him, he dresses up in a wolf costume, I kid you not, um, and he cleans all over St. Petersburg, but he's joining me and uh, keeping else beautiful, and the sea turtle trackers, and we're going to have a cleanup, fun games, giveaways, food, and uh, just learning about the turtle season coming up. Uh, and then I'm going to scoot over and see you all at the community center. So just wanted to let everybody know, and congratulations. And uh, this space is just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have any other public comments for non-agenda items? Um, we will move on to commissioner reports. We'll start with Commissioner Toth. Right. Um, good evening. Congratulations, Arden. I wish you well. 
Make sure you're close to the microphone. Sorry, I'm not used to that. Uh, the other one used to up all over the place. Thank you for attending in person. Welcome to our new city hall. And I'd like to remind everyone that the ribbon cutting ceremony is April 2nd at 6 p.m. I'd also like to echo Beth and thank our city staff that's persevered and got us here. And also kind of like to remember Amy Davis, our former city manager that also had a huge part in getting us moved into here. I would also like to extend a huge thank you to our Treasure Island Historic Historical Society for the amazing mural. And I look forward to seeing some of the treasures they've collected when we get them put out around this, our new city hall. I'd like to remind everyone that the AARP Foundation Tax Help is ongoing at the library on Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Please call ahead to reserve your time. Also, the library is expanding the events at the library to include painting, Mahjong, children's programs. Look it up on the ca updated calendar on the library website. You can also follow along the library on Facebook. Other upcoming events include the chicken, the children's Easter egg hunt this Saturday at 10 a.m. in the community park, and that's sponsored by Gulf Beaches Rotary. And thank you. Thank you all for coming in our new hall. Thank you. Commissioner Doctor? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to add one thing. Thank you very much for uh, promoting the Easter egg hunt. Um, what we would like people to do if they're going to go down, because it's going to be over here at the community center, and uh, we'd like people to arrive around 9 o'clock so that the kids have some excitement, and then they're going to start taking pictures with the Easter Bunny at 940. So if you want to get any pictures of your uh, grandchildren with the Easter Bunny or anything else, uh, be there a little bit earlier than 10, and, and that'll work out very well. Um, also, the... Uh, Isle of Palms is right now, as we speak, having their spaghetti dinner. And it looks like it's going to be a great success. Uh, my wife and I went down there and had dinner before we came over here. Uh, but if anybody needs anything to eat, they're still there, and they will be until 7. And then last of all, the Sons of the American Legion. Uh, usually we do a car show, and it's in April. Well, this year we're changing it. We originally said it was going to be in April, but now it is actually going to be May 25th. So uh, don't show up in uh, any weekend in April, but uh, we'll give you a time and uh, all the information uh, as we get closer to May 25th. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Minning. Yes, a couple of items. Um, I think the residents of uh, Paradise Island District 3 uh, have been aware of two issues that have been uh, more or less front and center, and that is the uh, revegetation or the re-landscaping of Paradise Boulevard. Uh, as one, and I am happy to tell you now that uh, that's, I could ask <laughs> City Manager Gary if you want to give us a little more update on that, please. Well, we're, we're actually going to talk about it at the workshop. Okay. But we've got uh, some ideas, and we've got, uh, we've got some ideas, and we've got some uh, ways that we're going to recommend we go forward from here. Uh, we, we had good feedback from uh, the residents of Paradise Island and we've put that together, and so we'll be able to talk to you about that in greater detail uh, after the time. At the, at the workshop. Are we at the workshop? At the workshop. Okay. Uh, workshop item will be a discussion then of uh, the landscaping along Paradise Boulevard. Uh, and the second one is what do we do about the um, Living Shoreline, um, the golf course uh, tr at Treasure Bay, um, and the um, <laughs> and there's I can help you with that. Yes. We're stuck uh, in a bit of a permit uh, issue right now. But as soon as we get that, and so that's one. As soon as we get that permit, uh, the uh, bids are going to go out for both the golf course and the living shore. Okay, and the trail. There'll be three separate elements. Uh, the bid package. Um, so um, the city can take all three, they can take two, they can take one, um, but it'll be up to their discretion. So what I want to say is stay tuned. Thank you. All right. Yep. Commissioner Dickey. <coughs> I have a couple of uh, let people know about on Friday 5th at the 
uh, there's going to be a bonfire on the beach at, at the jetty by the pavilion starting around 6 p.m. We'll have food there, uh, beverages available for sale, as well as selling T-shirts and uh, memberships. So uh, that's always one of the biggest events the Sunset Beach Community Association does, and it's lots of fun. I've been to several of them and, uh, and, and, had, and bring relatives to that one, too, because that, that's always a big hit. Uh, a second uh, upcoming event is on Thursday, May 2nd, will be the annual barbecue, Sunset Beach Barbecue at the Lions Club. Uh, Mr. I Got Him will cook the food and the beach rats will provide the uh, entertainment. So tickets for that event will be on sale at the bonfire. They'll be uh, charging $30 and there are a limited number of tickets. Only 135 tickets can be sold for that event. Uh, and finally, I just want to thank the voters of District 4 for giving me the honor to serve as their representative on this city commission. And that's all I have. All right, thank you. Um, for me, I just wanted to, I think it probably been said, but just want to make sure everyone's aware. Next Tuesday, right, um, April 2nd at 6 p.m., we will not have our normally scheduled commission meeting because it's the week after Easter. So when we set the schedule, we decided to um, cancel that one. But instead, we are going to be doing an official ribbon cutting for the city hall at 6 p.m. Um, so even though we're all here tonight, the staff has moved in, we're going to make it official a week from tonight on Tuesday, April 2nd at 6 p.m. So please join us. We'll be joined by the Tampa Bay Beaches of Chamber of Commerce and the Treasure Island Madeira Beach Chamber of Commerce, I believe, um, to help us with that ribbon cutting. Um, and we'll have our former um, city manager, Amy Davis, will be here as well for that since she was so involved with the, the whole project. And that is all I have for my report. So we'll move into approval of minutes. We have one set of minutes to approve for the commission regular meeting on February 6th. Um, do we have a motion to approve? Sure, I'll make a motion that we approve the regular commission meeting minutes on February 6th, 2024. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Do we have any? Comments or discussion on the minutes? Okay, any public comments? All right, hearing none, roll call please. Commissioner Todd? Aye. Commissioner Doctor? Aye. Commissioner Minning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Mayor Payne? Aye. All right, uh, we have no items on the consent agenda, so we'll move into our items of business. And first up is an election of a vice mayor. I have a introduction of that or sure sure um, let's see to nominate and elect a vice mayor is accordance with our city charter section 3.04 and city commission rule 2.1 the vice mayor will serve as mayor in the absence or disability of the mayor and as the presiding officer during commission meetings um, and this is something that we do um, every annually this year and um, annually excuse me Thank you. Um, so I'll open the floor for nominations for Vice Mayor. I'd like to nominate John Doctor. Okay. Do you accept the nomination? Yes. Do we have any other nominations? All right. Um, then I will in entertain a m motion to nominate um, John Doctor as our Vice Mayor. So moved. Second. 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 All right. Um, any comments or discussion? I think you'll do a great job. Thank you for being um, Any public comment? All right, hearing none, roll call, please. Commissioner Minning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Commissioner Toth? Aye. Commissioner Doctor? Aye. Sorry, Mayor Payne. Aye. Congratulations, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Okay, next is item J2, first reading and public hearing of ordinance 2024-05, amending chapter 68 zoning regulations regarding public boardwalks. We have a staff report. Um, Mayor, if I could, I'll read it by title. Oh yes, thank you. Ordinance 
an ordinance of the City of Treasure Island, Florida, amending Chapter 68 Zoning Regulations of the City of Treasure Island Code of Ordinances by revising Article 1 in general, Section 68-2 definitions to add a Section 68- I'm sorry, to add a definition for boardwalk, amending Section 68-463 miscellaneous lot regulations to include public boardwalk as an allowed structure over water, providing for severability, providing for conflict, providing for codification, and providing for an effective date. Okay, thank you. Mary Ellen. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, so this is the first reading in public hearing for Ordinance 2024-05, amending the zoning regulations, Chapter 68. Um, the purpose of this ordinance is to clarify the land development regs by amending Chapter 68 to add a definition of a public war boardwalk and to include a public boardwalk as an allowed structure over water. Um, <coughs> so we evaluated the land development regulations recently and determined that a clear definition was needed to be more consistent with existing public boardwalks. Um, a couple of them have approached our department about repairs and things of that nature, and in looking at that, we realized that we don't have a definition that um, meets what's currently out there. Um, so we want to uh, kind of bring these structures into conformance by creating a definition that will meet what it currently exists. Okay. Is it also in preparation for the living shoreline boardwalk? It, it, will, it will work for that as well, yes. All right. Any other questions for Mary Ellen? I, I have a question. Could this definition change in any way change our relationship or our arrangements with the lands in and mansions with their responsibility to maintain those uh, boardwalks there? I don't believe so, no. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. And it would allow them to, I know the one at Land's End has been torn down and they're planning a new one and this would still allow them to reconstruct Yes, actually, that's that's kind of what triggered okay. us looking into this was the discussions with them. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion. I move to approve and the and schedule ordinance twenty twenty four dash oh five for a second and final public hearing on April sixteenth, twenty twenty four. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Do we have any um, comments or further discussion? Thank you for putting this together. Do we have any public comment? No. Is it Amy Dennis? Yes. All right. Hello. Hello, my name is Amy Dennis. I'm a student at St. Petersburg College in the Public Policy Program, and we're learning about analyzing policy. My address is 1307 Crossbow Lane, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34689. I'm here to speak to agenda item J2. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this topic today. I met with Mary Ellen Edwards to gain a better understanding of this topic, and after speaking with her, I think the definition of a boardwalk should be established. I feel it is important because some of the existing boardwalk structures do not meet the current criteria for the definition of a dock. Currently, the definition of a dock is the only reference for boardwalk, rep boardwalk repairs. Without a definition for a boardwalk, the existing boardwalks have no guide for repair, and it is important to have that guide for safety reasons and to suggest alternative methods of repair other than pilings. Reducing the number of pilings will protect the water quality and the sea life. Lastly, it will benefit the community by providing them with a safe place to gather and to access the water, plus bring more traffic to surrounding businesses. Thank you for your time. Do we have any other public comment? <coughs> All right, hearing none, um, we'll do a roll call, please. Aye. Commissioner Minning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Commissioner Toth? Yeah, aye. Mayor Payne? Aye. All right, um, next is item J3, first reading and public hearing on ordinance 2024-03 amending section 3-4 proximity of establishments to church or school exception by removing the 50 room requirement for hotels from the exception 
and amending section 68-484 accessory uses in hotel, motels or hotels by removing the 50 room requirement from the incidental services and clarifying alcoholic beverage establishments for accessory uses in ho motels or hotels. Ordinance 2024-03, an ordinance of the City of Treasure Island, Florida, amending Section 3-4, proximity of establishment to church or school exception by removing the 50-room requirement for hotels from the exception, amending Section 68-484, uses in motels by removing the 50-room requirement from incidental services and clarifying alcoholic beverage establishments for accessory uses in motels or hotels, providing for severability, providing for conflict, providing for causation, and providing for effective dates. Okay. Mary Ellen? So um, it's um, chapter 68 of section 68484 states that incidental services used in conjunction with motels or hotels, including cigar and candy stands, restaurants and lounges, personal service shops, and similar uses um, may be permitted by special exception, provided they have at least 50 rooms. Um, so we spent a decent amount of time evaluating that 50 room requirement to see where that came from. And from what we were able to find, it trakes back to like 1920s, 40s liquor laws um, that have been amended over time um, and changed a little bit. I think right now it's it's um, for certain type of licenses you have to have, I think it's 50,000 50, residents or 100 rooms in the county. Um, so that 40s one has changed over time. Um, there's also a, a chapter 79, 554 laws of Florida um, that had a limitation on uh, hotels in Pinellas County. Um, but there was some research and consultation done with uh, the county attorney's office, and it was determined that that law is, is no longer in effect. So there's no, no conflict with that special act either. Um, so we kind of determined that that, that uh, 50 room requirement is outdated, and since it's associated with liquor laws that are regulated by um, the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation, uh, the Division of Alcoholic Beverages and Tobacco, um, it really doesn't need to be in our regulations because it's it's already regulated by them. And essentially what it does is it, it doesn't allow hotels of less than 50 rooms to have personal services or like a small cafe or, or a restaurant if they have the, 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 um, the space to do it. So um, we're kind of recommending that that 50 room requirement be removed from that. Okay, do we have any questions? Um, my question in reading the, the change to the code, so we're striking out um, in section 68484, mm -hmm. um, section A, we're striking out the 50 unit part of the conditions, but the second condition is that not more than 10% of the total floor area within the building shall be so used. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that that is in there. I mean, that seems equally as restrictive as the the 50 room rule. So, in conceptually, if someone were to build, in order to have a 3,000 square foot restaurant in their hotel, they would have to have a 30,000 square foot building. I see what you're saying. I mean, it's been in there since this section was put into place, probably back in, I think it was in the 60s. I think is when <laughs> when this went in. Um, Catherine, do you know the answer to that? Just reason for asking is because the part of the intent in modifying this is to allow a, a hotel to to have a restaurant in their in their hotel, and I mean to me, it doesn't. I don't really care if the hotel is a consists of five rooms on top of a restaurant on the whole second floor. Like I don't, if, if that's the model that they want to go with and they can have economic viability with that model, I don't really see why we would restrict that. Um. So I think the origin of that was that would, with the 200 square foot exception where you could have that without having that count towards your 
square footage that would be allocated to the restaurant versus um, it's a part of the density calculation. So I'm not sure that the way we have it crafted at the moment is quite what we were intending to do. What was to leave that 200 square foot exemption that would not use part of the density of the hotel. Not clear on that. Yeah. The 200 square feet thing, I guess. But I mean, well, there, there, were, there were two areas, and, and one of them was the 200 square foot thing, which is very, very small. And that's just available to somebody as a matter of, of right, not involved, not taken away from the density, because normally density is either units or floor area ratio. Uh -huh. We may, is, is what it's starting to sound to me like, we, we had intended to eliminate all of those barriers. And so if we didn't do that properly, then we will fix that in the next. Okay. Bob, did you have a question? Or yeah, I think that's the Sorry. proper approach is to uh, fix it and then bring it back because you've got two <coughs> conflicting statements. You've got one that says 10%, you've got another one that says not more than 200. Well, that there, there is a difference between those two. So the, the, the not more than 10% is by special exception that goes to the planning and zoning the 200 square feet is just permitted. As a, it's, it's just allowed. They're allowed to have 200 square feet, and it doesn't have to go to planning and zoning. So that's the difference in those two. So they don't really conflict. One has to go to P&Z for approval, and the other is just, it's just part of their site plan. So the 200 square feet is just part of the site plan? Correct. It's exempted from going to the P&Z as a special exception. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would everyone, does everyone have the same sentiment that that 10% isn't really necessary. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What would the process from here be to change that? Would it need to go back to LPA or planning and zoning, or could we amend that? Would you like more time to kind of make sure that that doesn't have any unintended consequences? I mean, I can tell you that we've advertised this for first reading, so and that change oh. would um, <coughs> be a substance that we would probably need to re-advertise it at a meeting. Okay. Um, but I would want to look at it more to see what the change would look like. So I'll bring it back. Okay. <coughs> do we, yeah, what, do we need to make a motion to table it or? Uh, no, you don't need to make a, a motion either way. I think you, I mean, other than that, I guess you could, you've given direction as to how to change Sounds good. Um, do you have any questions for us? So just and honestly, I think you may be able to even just eliminate all of the conditions. Well, that's what I was going to say. If we're looking at one, two, and three, way, and I've been talking to a developer who may have two separate buildings because it says it shall be in the main building and I don't really see a purpose to that. Either. Right, yeah. Okay, is everyone okay with that? Yeah, no condition. So basically it'll just say um, it is permitted at a restaurant or a um, bar essentially is permitted as allowed in the zoning district by special exception of the planning and zoning board. No condition. All right, um, I will open it up to public comment since we have this on the agenda, if there's anybody that wants to weigh in on this. All right, hearing no public comment, we'll go ahead and um, we'll move on. So thank you. Next is item J4, which is approved two grant amendments for the Treasure Bay Living Shoreline Project. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. I will be Stacy Boyle's voice tonight. <laughs> no, no, just answer, answer the question. <laughs> just answer. All right, um, this is just a little administrative housekeeping on the two grants for uh, the Living Shoreline on Treasure Bay. The two, uh, the city entered into two grant, grant agreements for the Treasure Bay uh, Shoreline project. 
It was the uh, Treasure Bay Estuary Program grant, which uh, hit its effective date is June 16th, 2020. The first minute effective date uh, was December 4th, 2021, which provides a total of $202,000 to go towards a the project design construction of the first 50 feet of the living shore. 500, I'm sorry. Feet of living shore. <laughs> I'm sorry. Getting whispered in the air. <laughs> um, <clears throat> provides construction of the first 500 feet of living, sh living shoreline pond restoration and educational signage. The other uh, grant is a resilient Florida grant and its effective date is June 23rd, 2023, which provides a total of 1.49 million towards design and construction of the living shoreline, berm, boardwalk, and restoration of ponds. Uh, the strategic plan, plan revel, or el, relevance uh, is to proactively maintain and improve infrastructure that meets the future needs of the city. And this was a part of our strategic plan. Due to the extensive permitting duration, a no cost time extension is needed to the grant agreement provided by the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. In addition to extending the task deadlines, the second amendment redistributes task funding it does not change the total funds being provided. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection Resilient Florida Grant First Amendment. The amendment does not change the task requirements or the funding provided. It provides updates to the standard terms and conditions which are listed below. I can go ahead and read all these. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> At this time, no funds are required. Uh, I move to approve the- That's, that's our amendment. part. Never mind. Um, yeah, two motions. Uh, also, we'll take any questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? I just wanted to clarify the date on the first page where it says resilient Florida grant. It says an effective date of June twenty third, twenty thirty three. I don't believe that's it's correct. it's twenty three. Thank you. I think it's actually like twenty twenty two. And I copy it. Yeah, it's twenty twenty three. 2022 because we 2022? yeah I looked at the all right it was signed in 2022 it wasn't 33 all right 22 okay any other questions um I have a few if no one else does um so specifically on the um amendment to the resilient Florida grant there's a list of those changes it sounds like most of them are pretty kind of boilerplate changes to the agreement, but I noticed that the name, one of them is a name change for the project, and it calls it the, instead of the Treasure Bay project, it calls it the Treasure Island Bay project. Is that intentional, or is that? It says in the whereas, as it says the um, project title shall here and after change from Treasure Bay Living Shoreline and Resiliency Project to the Treasure Island Bay Living Shoreline and Resiliency Project. I don't know, if maybe it was supposed to be just Treasure Island Re Living Shoreline and Resiliency Sorry. Project. Yeah, it's funny, we were looking at all the technical changes that we didn't notice the name change. Do you see, is that an issue or? I think it looks pretty similar. Okay. Um, and then <coughs> in attachment C, so in that same document, the addendum to the Resilient Florida Grant, in section, in attachment 1A, section 25, where it references um, investing in America, does that section apply to us? Which section did you say? Um, <clears throat> investing in America. It was in 1A. So attachment 1A, section 25. Okay, so the, um, the 
terms that are included here are terms that you would seek out through through the contract negotiation. I was just I assume that there's some like boilerplate language in here that doesn't necessarily apply to our project. So this was a um, grantees of an award for construction projects in whole or in part by the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act. Our project isn't funded by that, right? Um, and then I don't know. I think the project was awarded before that in the first place. Okay. And in attachment two, it talks about retainage. Can you explain whether there, if there's what that concept is and whether that has any implications? I think it's just saying that it's not required for a contract or for the right. So uh, there have been a lot of uh, bills that have come out recently with regard to retainage. So generally, when a local government does any kind of construction project, you have a certain level of retainage um, that you hold back on that project um, until they've met substantial completion. And then there's now the law is is then there is a list that can be created and you can return any retainage beyond that. This is just saying that under the grant, they're not having a requirement that um, for retainage. Okay. So when we bid that project, it would be in accordance with um, the, the current law and what our practices are with regard to retainage. Okay. So there's no retainage required, but we could incorporate that if we wanted to. Yes. Um, there's another reference to the sea level impact projection study requirement for that, called the S SLIP. What we said that we have requirement of always a historical project. Okay, so is that included in the project cost already? We do it in-house. We do it in-house, okay, great. And then in attachment 6A, it references the vulnerability assessment and that being a requirement of the project. Have we... Done this, for this particular project, our application referenced the watershed management plan, which we were able to use adjacent properties to demonstrate the vulnerability of the site. Um, but going forward, it is becoming a hard and fast requirement that you meet the state's vulnerability assessment protocol in order to qualify for Pavilion Florida funding. This, again, was one of those ones that was awarded prior to that criteria being established. But if we're amending the agreement to reference that, it says for all planning grant agreements, the grantee must submit exhibit I, vulnerability assessment compliance checklist certification with the final grant deliverables. This is, so we have a planning grant with the state. Um, this is a um, implementation grant. So the planning grant that we have under Resilient Florida to develop the vulnerability assessment, but this is an um, implementation grant. Okay, so that section doesn't, it's, it's, not a it's not a planning it's not a planning grant okay all right those are my uh, technical questions I have some overarching questions that Commissioner Minning started to hint at just about the Treasure Bay project in general so um, and Gary already touched on them a little bit just but just so we can have a kind of status update on the project the we're only waiting on one more permit right for the for this project to move forward the Yes and no. Um, so we've gotten, um, we have the permits from the county, um, from the state, which we've permitted through Swift Land. They are waiting on the Division of State Lands, the DEP, to sign over a boundary line agreement. The Army Corps has indicated months ago that they're ready to provide us the permit, but they have to wait on the state. So really, we're being held up by what seems to be a technicality at the Division of State Lands, and Jen drafted a a note to them today to explain our positioning in that, which not only affects our project, but many other living shoreline projects. So, so Jen, I think. So what are, we, yeah, what are we doing about that to push this along? Okay, so the first thing I did was reach out to um, our contact at State Lands, who we deal with on a host of different projects, um, and that's Brad Richardson. And uh, we, I wrote kind of a lengthy email expressing what our concerns were, the history of the project, how all of the other permitting was done, also with regard to what appears to be their concern, um, the fact that there are numerous other projects that have been permitted um, 
regardless of that concern and providing additional information and kind of ending it with let us know if you need anything else or just get your permit. <laughs> um, and he acknowledged the receipt of it and asked that we give him a week or two to digest and discuss. So, um, like I said, there was a, a good bit of information that was provided. Arguably, I would say that that information had been provided before, just in a different format. Um, and so at this point, we're waiting on further information. Okay, so he asked for a couple weeks to review? Yeah, one to two. One to two weeks, okay. So by our next commission meeting, we should be able to have a better update, mm -hmm. or hopefully have that, them signed it. Well, uh, yeah. And if not, we will get a final vote. Okay. <coughs> All right, and that's just for the living shoreline. Are we, do we have any grants that, or any permits that are outstanding that we need to get for the golf course, or that will all be able to be, once we, if we go out to bid on it, that'll be something that we just permit in internally. Um, and are we going, is the plan to move forward with the Living Shoreline independently of the golf course? Or are we still trying to, I know at some point we were trying to really time those together, but at this point, are we just gonna, can we move forward with the Living Shoreline as soon as those permits are ready? We're ready to move forward on the golf course right now. It's really the Living Shoreline that they're looking at right now. Okay, so what's the next step on the golf course is just to, publish an invitation to bid? Yep, so we're gonna have, um, as was mentioned, we're gonna have a full bid schedule. It's a kayak launch, it was a decision that you all would make. Um, the trail is a separate one. So anytime we have a grant, it's like, oh, this is what you would have to bid schedule because it makes tracking and reporting of that grant much simpler and cleaner. And it gives you all the opportunity if something comes over and something doesn't to make that decision of what you wanna do. Okay, so it'll all be one invitation to bid with the shoreline and the golf course. And those are all required submittals on the bid, so in order to be a responsive bidder, you respond on all of them. And the design team on both ends have identified contractors that could perform as a team to overlap that way. So we've started to reach out to those folks who would be interested in bidding. It's the most cost-effective way to do it. Um, it takes a lot of liability of work performing um, for multiple contractors on one site should minimize our construction duration should you choose to pursue this project. Okay. Um, do we foresee that it's, will, there are contractors out there that will be responsive? Yeah, we, we, um, we've had this conversation as soon as you all just told us to go forward with the design of the golf course. That was a conversation that we had with the full team together and looked at qualifications and how it would overlap. When you really, when it comes down to it, a lot of it is earth moving work on both ends. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have some specializations in there, um, but it would be a team type of response to a bid. Okay. Um, so, so we are waiting on the, so we're ready to go with the golf course. It's really the living shoreline. So once we have that per last or that permit, once we get some movement with state lands, then we should be able to pretty quickly get at an invitation to bid out. They've already even done the advertisement. There's a 21-day public advertisement requirement notification and responses for the boundary line agreement, and that's already all been done and everything. So it's really a bid. Okay. We've been in the loop during the process, so it's coming out of nowhere. We should have been out the bid. Okay. Any other questions? I was going to ask, just ask a question. I re recall somewhere uh, hearing that we are on some kind of a deadline as far as the grants are concerned, that if we don't start the work by a certain date, mm -hmm. we risk losing those grants. Is that still, did I understand that correctly? So the estuary program grant does expire at the end of this month, which is um, what the addendum is doing for us here, is it's pushing that out. So it's giving us that time that we need. Okay. Thank you. So the responses that uh, will will come into the uh, bid package can be submitted individually. No, to be a responsive bidder, they must respond to all of them because that's how you achieve the um, the non overlap. If you want to pursue both projects and you get the most cost reduction benefit by grouping it as one project. 
But we could move forward with only select parts of the bid if we want it. So we'll, we'll have an idea of what each one of those com parts of the project would cost. But if we, if the cost of the golf course is so high that we want to scratch that part, we can not accept that one and still move forward with the living shoreline. That, with is, that, is, that is correct. Okay. So when the bids come in, we then select the lowest bid, right? The sum total of all four of them. So everybody has... It's unresponsive if you don't put one of them in there, right? Unresponsive. So all of them come together, we get that cost, and then we bring it to you, and you, you go down the list, and you go, I want to do one, three, and four, or whatever it is. And you select what you want to do at that point. So if some of it doesn't match up with what we think it's going to be, then you can cancel it. Do we not, if we uh, proceed along that line, do we not lose the advantage that you have just stated uh, of a one-time mode demode? That is correct. So suppose the uh, living shoreline, we didn't, we, just for example, didn't, didn't approve it. Um, so how does that figure into the mode and demode cost? Well, it'll be based upon the percentage of the total. So if their mobilization for the total project is $1 million and we only did one, three, and four, you take one, three, and four, add them up, put the percentage, which let's say is 75%, that's your mobilization cost. And that's included in the documents? Each individual. When, they, when we traditionally do bids like this, you have a bid project and then you have the bid alternate. And so the bid alternates should stand on their own as the a la carte menu <laughs> for you all to choose from. And so in determining who's the lowest bidder, you'll look at all, you know, they'll evaluate all of them and whoever has the lowest bid will be the lowest bidder, which will be brought before you. Um, and then you can choose which scopes you want to actually move forward with. And what are the four um, aspects? I of said it. Of three. I don't know if there's four. I just there is actually much more than four. Okay. You have the first 500 feet of shoreline, which is permitted or granted separately. You have the ponds, which are granted separately. The trail, which is a separate grant. You have the kayak launch, which could be a take it or leave it on your end if you want to pursue the kayak launch. Um, and then the other portion of the living shoreline. So it's quite complicated but it's not uncommon for projects where we have multiple elements and it doesn't even have to be a grant funded project. It could be you have multiple enterprise or non-enterprise funds that are intermixed to fund a project and you want to account for those discreetly. So it's not uncommon. Okay, and a lot of it's schedules. Okay, and one of those will also be the golf course Correct. will be all yes. its own one. The golf course will be its own. Okay. Is that clear to everyone how that's gonna work with the bid? Seems skeptical. Mud. <laughs> okay, um, that answers my questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Mooney, are you good? Well, I'll wait and see how it comes in. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why we did it this way, also, because it's, it's individually, it's grant based, and then it's where the money is going. So, we, but you guys can't pick. So when, it, so when it comes in, I can just take the total bid price, all projects together, and I can assign a percentage uh, to each of those of the total, and that's equivalent to the percentage of MOB and DMOB at each of so the projects. So mobilization will have a line item in each bid schedule. No, well, typically when we do one lump sum project, that is how it is. But each, each individual bid schedule will have a line item for mobilization. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. You'll be able to pick off a menu. That was my impression, but I got confused with Yeah, well, that was because of the voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we have two motions before us in the um, memo, so I'll entertain the first motion for the um, DEP permit. I move to approve the First Amendment to the contract 22FRP08 with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Second. 
Okay, it's been moved and second. Do we have any further commission discussion? Okay, any public comment on the DEP Resilient Florida Grant Amendment? That's fine. Sure. Okay. Excuse me, Greg Chuning, four nine two zero five Third Street East, Treasure Island. Um, I didn't think much of of this particular um, agenda item because I know it has to do with permitting and things like that and grants and what have you. But I have heard some things up here that I I, I just have to speak up about. I've done. I'm a professional engineer. I have constructed somewhere around three, four hundred acres worth of landfills in my life. I used to work for waste management. I have built transfer stations, recycling centers, all kinds of things. And I want everybody to understand something. Mobe, demobe does not mean what you think it means and what's being described to you right now. Contractors use that particular line item on their bids to load up up front. They do that so that they have money coming in for cash flow purposes. So it does not, if you had a bid, say a million dollar bid, and it, it had $150,000 of mobilization, it does not cost them $150,000 to put equipment on trucks and bring it to your site. That is not what's going on. Um, so that's, that's a, a misnomer. Also, I want to remind everybody that when we talked about the golf course before, um, that we were going to get a cost estimate for the management cost of that. Uh, so that we could figure out whether we could go any further and spend any more money and spend any more effort and what have you. So that's not what's going on here now. What I'm hearing today. So that's very disappointing to me as well. Um, so, um, and as far as permits go, um, you know, uh, uh, swift mud and things like that, they're very, they're very specific to what you're going to build. So it seems to me like we're, we're again going down this path that where the camel's nose is going a little bit further underneath the tent before we've all really decided what this thing might cost us in the future. That's one thing I'd like to talk about. Number two, the last time I was here, uh, I told you I have a lot of experience with building littorial shells, in particular um, wetland mitigation and actually building wetlands. And um, I love the living shoreline idea. I think it's a great thing, but I just want to, again, caution you that you, you should get a second set of eyes on this because Mother Nature, you can't control her. And I've seen wonderful projects spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars building acres of wetlands and shorelines and stuff like that are destroyed like that. So I don't know who's in charge of the long-term maintenance of this thing. But again, I support it. Just take the time and get a second or third set of eyes and make sure that what is designed and what is built, or as built, is proper. And make sure that a contractor has some some responsibility and accountability for making sure it's done right. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, hearing none, any further commission discussion? I just wanted to comment, like address what you mentioned about the cost estimates. We do have cost estimates on this. So the, the next step in this process was that we were going out to bid and we we're gonna evaluate what the bid price was. And at that point, we will make a decision on whether or not to move forward with the, with the golf course. So that was, that's what I've communicated to the public. Those are the conversations that I've had and what has been um, stated up here. So I just wanted to clarify. Any other comments? All right, uh, roll call, please. Vice Mayor Doctor? Aye. Commissioner Minning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Commissioner Toth? Aye. Mayor Payne? Aye. All right, I'll entertain the next motion for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program grant. I move to approve the second amendment to the contract with Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Second. Okay, any further commission discussion on the TBEP grant? Okay, any public comment? All right, hearing none, roll call, please. Vice Mayor Doctor? Aye. Commissioner Minning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Commissioner Toth? Aye. Mayor Payne? Aye. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, next item is J5, authorize the city manager to sign contract renewals with Applied Sciences Consulting, Trans Systems, and Stantec for as-needed civil engineering services 
and authorized the city manager's purchase authority in the total of amount of $60,000 for Applied Sciences Consulting Trans Systems and Stantec for fiscal year 2024. Um, so for this item, uh, the city entered in into a professional service contract with um, Trans Systems, uh, it was Cardno at the time, uh, now Stantec, and Applied Sciences in 2018. Um, they were selected through the RFQ process and each contract had a duration of five years, um, which included the option to provide up to three one-year extensions uh, to those contracts. Um, the three firms were selected so we had a stability for multiple um, engineers to use. Um, they provide as-needed civil engineering reviews and inspection services for subdivisions, site plans, site mods, and permit submissions. And um, there are additional services that they can offer outlined in the contracts, such as um, surveying, um, I don't know, surveying, I think mapping, environmental services, other items that the city may need throughout the fiscal year. Um, the majority, or I wouldn't say the majority, but a portion of these fees um, are actually collected through the permitting process. So we collect a portion uh, that's allowed through our fee schedule um, for the engineering reviews that they do for our permit applications in CDD. Um, so we were looking to renew these contracts with these three engineers um, through it was 2026, so we're, we're recommending that we take the three one-year extensions and combine them into one so we have time because um, to go back out through the RFQ process would take, take some time. Um, and then we're um, asking for uh, the city manager's um, purchasing authority for these. And I think it's important to note this money is in the budget currently, um, so it's, it's we're not asking for anything that's not already in the budget. Um, we're just looking for the authority to spend, and I guess um, if it's up to, Sign. if we think that one one of the engineers is going to exceed twenty five thousand, then we need the purchasing authority for that. Okay. Um, any questions? Uh, just to clarify, just because the money's in the budget doesn't mean it has to be spent. I agree. I, I was just letting you know that it it, it is in there. It's special hey, for, the, for the new yeah, that's, that's not an automatic. Understood. I was just saying that it is it is per currently in the budget. I was just saying I wasn't asking for more money. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so. And do we know how much was spent last year on these services? I did pull the numbers, and from for the fiscal last fiscal year, it was like forty two thousand. Okay. And have the rates um, gone up, or are the rates all the same? They have gone up. Um, so the the initial rates were in twenty eighteen, and now we have new rate sheets for. Um, for this contract, and they, uh, the way we did the contract, they're for the term of the contract, the new rates. We'll run through 2026. Okay. <clears throat> and do those increases seem reasonable? What were the? Yeah, they're all consistent across the board with the three, three engineers and, and with the inflation over five years now. Okay. I think they're consistent also with uh, what's going on in the marketplace. Any other questions? All right, I'll entertain a motion then. I move to approve and authorize the city manager to sign contract extensions with Applied Sciences, Sciences Consulting Inc., Trans Systems, and Stantec for as needed civil engineering services and authorize the city manager's purchase authority for up to $60,000 for ongoing civil engineering services with Applied Sciences Consulting Inc. Trans Systems, and Stantec, Inc. for the fiscal year of 2024. Thank you. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Do we have any further commission discussion? We started this contract in 2018, correct, with the three companies? Correct. It's just, I can't remember what the original cost bid was for that, but um, we do recoup some of the costs from the permitting, mm -hmm. and it's put back in. Fund of sixty thousand for engineering services only. Right. Okay. I was only confirmed because I was kind of remembering approving the companies when we put through them back in twenty eighteen. So depending on whether it's a project that's for a um, someone ap externally applying, that would be 
charge to their permit fee, right? If this is something that we had to Correct. do because of someone applying for a permit, but we also may use these services for s certain things that are internal to the, like a city project, right? And, and not just CDD, it could be used by any department in the city. So. so that's why the funding comes from either the general fund or could potentially come from the building fund if it's for a project relating to someone who's come in for a permit, right? Correct. Other comments? All right. Any public comment? Sir? Yes, they have moved. Every, so everything has. <laughs> I think they're actually out in the hallway. Tuning one one two zero five Third Street East. Um, I, I certainly, as a civil engineer, I certainly understand a city needs to have those civil engineers on staff. So that, you know, when things come up and what have you. I think the concern that um, that I and others um, that you've been talking to uh, recently is the concern is is that when you do this and you have a pot of money, you know, how do you really control that to make sure that it's being focused on things that is really necessary and important for the city and the direction the city wants to go? So that's part of it. Number two, I think the increase um, is questionable because we're not, you know, I, I know there's inflation, but um, know that my salary's not going up and um, so I question that, that that amount I haven't done the math but it sounds like it's somewhere between 20 and 30 percent increase so you know maybe something less than that would be more reasonable and how do you monitor to make sure it's being applied to the right types of projects that's that's my comment thank you for your time okay thank Mayor, you can I address that for just a second please sure because uh, what Mr. Tuney is saying is is accurate to a point uh, this $60,000 provides us engineering services that we do not have on staff. Uh, we don't have an engineering department. We've got a public works department that happens to have an engineer in it, uh, but we do not have an engineering firm. So this is a capability. We couldn't buy a single engineer for $60,000 a year. And so this, for a couple of different reasons, is why we're ready to do this. Uh, one is we can scale it up and scale it down depending on the volume of work. Uh, and then second of all, uh, it is over time uh, less expensive because we don't have to hire people, train them, and lay them off when we don't have them. Uh, as to his uh, point about managing this money, we manage this money on a monthly basis. Uh, and they talk to me about why it is that we're spending and what it is we're spending it on. Uh, so there is... QAQC on where this is going and why it's going there. Okay, thank you. Any other public comment, Carlos? I, hello, my name is Carlos Mural. Uh, I live at 10231 Tarpon Drive, and um, uh, just, just this facility is beautiful. Really, uh, really a pleasure to be here, and I love the mural. The uh, that Treasure Island Historical Society did a great job, um, and so I'm speaking in, in regards to this. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Doctor, congratulations, and uh, uh, Commissioner Dickey, congratulations. Um, but um, I, I'm speaking in regards to this, uh, and and I, I know that the um, the budgeting and authority and the and the uh, the, uh, the commission's uh, responsibility over the fiscal. Uh, Health of the of the city is very important. It's really basically the the primary responsibility that you all have. And I know that uh, you're checking to see how much time I have. No, Thank I you. Have <laughs> sun <coming> in. <laughs> and I I I I know that you all take the, 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 your that responsibility very seriously, Mr. Minnie. And I I very much appreciate you saying that if the money's in the budget, we don't necessarily have to spend it. Um, so in regards to this particular um, thing, the cost is, as I understand it, is um, sixty thousand. And I, and I have to leave immediately, so I won't be able to stay for, for the entire discussion. I apologize for that. But the, the cost is $60,000 for the current fiscal year, but the request is to reinstate the contracts through November 2026. So the question I, I had doesn't necessarily need to be, but hopefully the commissioners will, will have it answered, is um, um, so it's a three-year uh, renewal process, right, that through tw November 2026 and then Three one-year renewal periods. Does that mean sixty thousand dollars will be, you know, will be coming back each year for an additional sixty thousand dollars? 
Yes, in, in fiscal 2024, $60,000. So I guess what I'm asking is, 2025, is there going to be another $60,000 requested and so forth and so on? Um, and then I mentioned that the costs are, are paid in part through review fees uh, for, for the applicants, for permits and development applications. Just wondering, what percentage of that of that cost is paid by those fees? Uh, is it 10%? Is it 90%? Uh, that would be you know, a question I would have. And I know that the commissioners take that uh, fiscal responsibility very, very seriously. And I'm sure that you all would, would be, be interested in, in knowing that if you don't know it already. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk in this beautiful space. And Mr. Mayor, it's always a pleasure to, to see you presiding. And, and uh, Mr. Brunbeck, uh, thank you so much for all, all you do for your city. I, we, we all appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, to address some of those concerns, um, I believe you're correct that it would be, while it's a multi-year contract, we'll have to do this every year because we have to approve the spending authority every year, just as we do with every other vendor. Um, so while it's a multi-year, we will approve it each year. So I think that and covers we, the... We can find that uh, percentage of what pays for what, and I can see the email. Okay. Sounds good. Just a comment. The um, it's, it's a double, double whammy here but as part of this, we're approving the contracts for 2026, but we're only approving your authorization, city manager authorization, for one year. That is correct. Okay. And we'll come back re each year for reauthorization of that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, any further public comment? Gosh. All right, hearing none, roll call, please. Vice Mayor Doctor. Aye. Commissioner Minning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Commissioner Toth? Aye. Mayor Payne? Aye. All right. Um, on to item J6, our last agenda item, which is appointment of city commissioners to local boards. The city commissioners are appointed annually to represent the city on various local boards um, following uh, the swearing in of uh, new commissioners. So for your consideration and discussion, commissioners' um, appointments, um, we have the Barry Government Council, so Big C. We have the Gulf Beach Public Library. Um, and we have the Pinellas COC, the Continuum of Care. We have the Suncoast League of Cities and the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council and also Treasure Island and Madeira Beach Chamber of Commerce. So for your consideration and uh, discussion. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, well, we will, how about we just open it up to start. Um, who is interested in doing what? I can, I'm going to kind of wipe the slate clean for you guys, actually, because I, so I currently serve on the big C um, as the primary representative, and I have done that for three years, um, and I am ready to step away from that and turn that over to somebody else if they would like to. Um, I think it's a great group, mostly mayors, um, but there are some other cities like Clearwater who have appointed other people from their commission to be on there. Um, it's a great learning experience. Um, I just think three years I've, I've done enough of it. I also am, by function of being the mayor, I have access to the, or I'm a member of the Pinellas County Mayor's Council as well. So um, I'm also going to be, I put my name in the hat for the Tourist Development Council through the Mayor's Council. They get to appoint someone to that. So that'll be voted on at the April meeting. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to garner some support for that. But um, I have a lot of boards that I serve on and I am kind of trying to streamline a little bit and open up some opportunities for you guys. So. With that being said, I would be happy to serve as an alternate for some of these boards, but I'm going to open them all up to, for you guys to um, take your pick up. Not just Big C, but I, I don't need to be a representative on, on any of these. So who's interested in, in doing what? Let's start with the Vice Mayor. I'd be interested in serving on the Big C. Mm -hmm. 
and the Treasure Island Deer Beach Chamber. Is everyone okay with that? Or is anyone else interested in the big C? All right, hearing none. Um, I'll I'll do the I'll be the alternate for that if that's okay. That's cool. And how about the Gulf Beaches Public Library? That's cool too. All right. I'm also interested in the continuing of care, but I okay. need a little clarity on when they meet. First Friday of every other month. Then I could do that. Perfect. That'd be great. Any everyone okay with that? And the Suncoast League of Cities, and just as a reminder for this one, since I'm the, I'm a past president of the Suncoast League of Cities, so by virtue of that, I will always have, as long as I'm in elected office, I'll have a vote um, as a delegate of the Suncoast League of Cities. So I will stay involved in that, but it, um, if we have another appointee as our designate, we'd have two votes in anything that they do. So is anyone interested in Suncoast League of Cities. I, I would be interested in that. Okay. Are you Sanko? Because I think you're the rep right now. Is that you're good with passing that off to us? Okay. It's a great learning experience, so I think that would be a, a wonderful way to it's a great way to learn um, about what other cities do and now, Commissioner Toth and I participated in the Florida League of Cities Institute for Elected Municipal Officials, um, which is kind of a, so Florida League of Cities is the larger umbrella over the Suncoast League of Cities, so I encourage you to look into that. They do like a weekend course um, somewhere around the state, and it, it gives you the groundwork for everything that you need to know about municipal government. It's a really great sure. program. Thank you. I think um, it's in Orlando in June is this it? year. It was on the East Coast last um, is anyone interested in being the alternate for that? You want to be the alternate? I'll be just under the alternate. Um, and the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council? You want to do that too? Yeah, yeah, I'd certainly like to do that one too. I'll stick on as alternate. When do they meet? I can find out and get back to both the uh, primary and the alternate. I just know that I had to take time with other people. Do you mind if I serve as the alternate for that? Not at all. Okay. Yeah. Because I have to take leave if I have to go. Okay. So I have Perfect. some notice. Thanks. We worked it out. So all right, I think that covers everything. Um, anything that we missed? We got there's it. Not, there's not an alternate for uh, the treasure, the uh, Chamber of Commerce? Is that correct? I don't think it requires one. But that's good. That is good. Do you ever? I, don't, I, d I think that's, a, that's also a function of their bylaws. So I don't think they allow us to ap appoint a bylaw. I would assume their bylaws probably require that the person voting be there. Um, do we need an alternate? I do need an alternate for the library, yeah. so please. Thank you to our city manager for sitting in for me on Monday. I was really grateful. Just I have no alternate. Um. I'm going to do some targeted outreach on that one and try to see if we can I can recruit someone. So I will, let's leave that one open and we'll see what we can drum up. If we can't find anyone, I might, I might be interested in backing you up for that one. Yeah, the only problem is we've vote on the budget, so it would be kind of, sorry, we do vote on the budget, so it would be a discussion with the budget and things coming forward with the Oh budget. yeah, so two people on that. Yeah, that's so the only thing I would worry about. We from the public. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. Let's get I to like recruiting. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, I will entertain. Oh, Mayor, I'm sorry. Sure. For the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Commission, they actually meet on the second Monday at 10 o'clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So let me just make sure I got this correct. So the Barrier Island Government Council, the Big C, we have the Vice Mayor as the representative and Mayor as the, Mayor Payne as the alternate. Okay. The Gulf Beach is public library and then the citizen representative once we once we get them. Okay. The Pinellas Continuum of Care will be Commissioner Toth and there's no alternate. Okay. And then we have Suncoast League of Cities that's uh, Commissioner Dickey with uh, Vice Mayor Doctor as the alternate. And the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, again, Commissioner Dickey and the uh, alternate is Mayor Payne. And then for the Treasure Island and Madeira Beach Chamber, we have Vice Mayor Doctor with no alternate. Perfect. Do you want to make a motion to approve as she just read off? Sure. It's a little easier for you. <laughs> I, I, I move uh, to appoint the city commissioner as was just listed by the city clerk uh, for the board's year of 2024. Second. And I, my one request is that we make these effective on April 1st, as we do have a Big C meeting tomorrow morning. Um, so I would like to go to that and um, let everyone know that I'll be passing the reins off to Vice Mayor Doctor. All right. Um, do we have any further comments or debate? Any public comment? All right. Roll call, please. Vice Mayor Doctor? Aye. Commissioner Manning? Aye. Commissioner Dickey? Aye. Commissioner Toth? Aye. Mayor Payne? Aye. All right, thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll adjourn our regular meeting and um, we'll reconvene in about five minutes for our workshop.
All right, welcome back everyone. This is the Board of Commissioners workshop meeting for March 26, 2024. We'll go ahead and get started with our city manager and city attorney reports. We don't have a report this evening. Okay, I've got a couple, most of which is, two of which, two of the three have been already talked about before. One is the April 2nd ribbon cutting Second is the April 13th Treasure of the Island Community Appreciation Day. Uh, and then the last one, I know I've talked to you all and we've mentioned it before uh, in this meeting, but I want to just reinforce to everybody that that lateral project on Gulf Boulevard starting tomorrow. And, uh, and we, it's, as I've explained to, we're limiting the MOT to 300 feet to minimize the disruption in traffic. Uh, we're going to be starting on the south side. Uh, we believe that uh, by the time we get to where we expected to be the biggest problem, which is up by 112th, uh, that spring break will have passed because uh, it's going to take us a couple of weeks to get there. So uh, because the contractor was unable to get all of the supplies that he needed in order to kick the project off, we've been delayed uh, about a week and a half which is actually going to end up serving in our best interest because it's going to take it out of the heat of spring break. That's all I have. You said you're starting on the south side. Where specifically? West South. West South. And and what what will happen on that? Uh, you know, go from one lane, two lanes to one lane, south down, or what? Okay. So um, <clears throat> when we say on the south side, we're going to go from 99th to 112th, but we're going to start on the south side and move our way north, okay? So it's going to be about 350 feet of MOT. One lane is going to be uh, closed down, and it will be on the southbound lane. Most of the work is going to be on the southbound lane, which helps us out because it's it doesn't get clogged up as bad. Once we get closer to 107th and 112th, you have the stoplight or you have the, the signal light. Those are going to cause us a little bit of problems, but I believe we can get through it. It's going to be on the south side until <clears throat> we come up here. We're looking at it probably 30 to 90 second delays because it's only 350 feet, right? So you can't really back up too much until you get to lights. Once lights start to happen, now you have the light, and each light is about 60 seconds. So you have to add that on to the MOT, right? So for it... 30 to 60 seconds, and you have a 60 second light, you're two and a half minutes. So that is the area that we're going to be looking at causing the most problems. We're going to do that at the end of the project. So as we progress, we're going to go 350 feet. Once we finish that, we're going to move north 350 feet. Then we're going to move north 350 feet. And the reason why I say 350 feet is we have to have 50 feet to get everybody over. And the length of a of the manholes <clears throat> are 300 feet. So once we get past that, I have to have that whole 350 blocked off because we have um, we have the um, uh, we have the truck, the vac truck, and then also the truck that actually puts the uh, the liner inside. But that will be done in the that one southbound lane on the outside lane. And I think we can get all that done um, in the next, you know, I believe that it will be done in six weeks. And so has, with been has this been communicated on the, on the Treasure Island website? Oh, yes. And the uh, newsletter as well? The newsletter, yeah. all of our social media, yeah. so every means by which we can communicate. Yes. And we've been doing it for several weeks. Yeah, the date the date has changed a little bit, but the the duration's not. So we didn't start two weeks ago, so it's just going to get pushed two weeks. Oh, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions on that? Is that the end of your report? That's the end of my report. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, on our discussion items, we just have one item, which is discuss the Paradise Island landscaping project scopes. Bad meeting for Stacy to not have a voice. <laughs> I'm going to do the reading and she's going to do the answering. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
This is uh, just a discussion item. Uh, we're going to discuss the Paradise Island landsca landscaping project scope. Paradise Boulevard median. A Paradise Island resident with professional experience in vegetation maintenance for power companies raised concerns to the former mayor, a uh, former city manager, regarding the Paradise Boulevard palm trees interfering with the power lines. Staff has also had concerns about the frequent failures of the old irrigation system within the median areas. In September 2023, the City Commission approved a work authorization and spending authority with half Associates Inc. in the amount of $76,668.38 for landscape architect services for Paradise Boulevard mediums and the shoulder areas along the West Causeway from Bar Paradise Boulevard to the West Causeway Bridge. According to our ground maintenance supervisor, Foxtel Palms, around 12 feet in total height were planted along the medians of Paradise Boulevard approximately 12 years ago. Today, today they are growing into the overhead communication and power lines. The lower lines are about 17 feet high. Duke Energy has been known to cut off the tops of palm trees during vegetation maintenance or to resolve issues. In July 2023, city staff contacted the Vegetation Management Division at Duke Energy to request their analysis of the Paradise Boulevard medium palm trees, and this was their response. Some palms are going to be actively burning in the lines in the next six months, and others probably have another five years before they touch the lines. When reliability issues start is probably somewhere in between that time frame. In January 2024, the city reached out to a couple of palm tree brokers to see if they had any interest in purchasing the foxtail palms on Paradise Boulevard or removing them for free. One company said they had no interest in the palms and another said they might be interested in taking maybe four or five of them for free. There are 33 double foxtail palms on, on Paradise Boulevard and six singles which were doubles at one point. There were three other doubles that were cut down due to disease in the past. There are also a few cabbage palms within the median. Paradise Lane and Treasure Lane. The reestablishment of a drainage well was planned on the north side of West Causeway Shoulder from Paradise Boulevard to the West Bridge, which would require that the existing bottle brush trees be removed and the irrigation be replaced. Additionally, residents contacted the former city manager requesting new landscaping along Paradise Lane and Treasure Lane. To fit this project into the landscaping budget, staff proposed a simple design that could be added, in, uh, added to in the future. In January 2024, a public engagement meeting was held to vote on plants that were proposed for the Paradise Boulevard mediums. Following this meeting, Several concerns were raised about the removal of the palm trees. A door hanger was provided to all Paradise Island residents requesting landscaping feedback in mid-February. A summary of the feedback received and the votes from the engagement meeting are provided um, as attachment A. The split results for the voting was palm trees votes at 15, other trees at 14. During the engagement process, the Paradise Boulevard, uh, during the engagement process for Paradise Boulevard, several comments were also received about the proposal to reestablish the drainage swell along Paradise Lane. The complaints centered around the aesthetic appearance of the depressed areas and the length of time that stormwater is held within the areas after prolonged rain events. Project alternatives. In lieu of moving forward with the re-landscaping of the Paradise Boulevard medians with vegetation that can be maintained lower than the utility lines, one option is to simply replace the irrigation and any impacted grass while maintaining all the landscape components. This alternative recognizes the request to keep the palm trees within the median, medians, although the palms will continue to grow into the lines and may present issues in the future. If this option or Another option is preferred staff will generate, will renegotiate the scope of work under the work authorization with the landscape architect. In this instance, a revised project scope with the landscape architect would come back before the commission for review and approval. 
Additionally, if any, if a greater stormwater project is preferred along the West Gulf, West Causeway, I'm sorry, staff would propose holding off on the landscaping along Paradise Lane and Treasure Lane at this time. Staff will present project alternatives during the fiscal year 25 budget review process. This change would also require a revision to the work authorization that would come back before the commission review and approval. No funding is requested at this time. <coughs> and I'll have Stacy answer any questions. Okay. Do we have any questions for Stacy? Let's parse this out into two the two topics, which is the Paradise Boulevard portion and then the Paradise Lane and Treasure Lane. So let's start with the Paradise Boulevard median. Do we have any um, comments on what was in the report? Is that a feeder line or is that a main line for the rest of the island? Where does it start, stop? It's just for Paradise Bowl. It's just for Paradise Island. So it won't affect anybody else's electricity in a storm if the power it, gets it should out not. by the pond? It should not. I had somebody ask me that question and I didn't have an answer to it. Are, are there? Sorry. Go ahead. Is that all? Um, what section was supposed to be undergrounded there? Wasn't part of Paradise? That was over on um, Yacht Club. Park Bend and Yacht Club. Yeah, Park that was done by Duke Energy, uh, just the undergrounding. That was part of their uh, um, hardening project. Yeah, none of that was supposed, nothing on Paradise Boulevard was undergrounded. We did calculate what we thought the estimate for undergrounding that was, and we're talking about probably 2.5 to $3 million. And the only reason why I know that is I'm comparing it to Gulf Boulevard. Thank you. Commissioner Dickey. It, you had mentioned that uh, trees that are problematic right now, that they're in the next few months, uh, that they're likely to uh, be a problem with Duke Energy. Is there, are there current plans to take care of those trees right now, or are we going to wait for Duke Energy to remove them or remove the tops at least? Yeah, they won't look good. So we should, um, depending on what you all decide tonight, if you're going to leave the existing trees, we would have a contractor come and take care of the ones that are problematic now. There's about five that are within the high voltage area now. Um, and then there's other few that don't look great that the city will have to yeah. remove. Well, the company that volunteered or offered to take four, four or five of these off of our hands uh, at no charge, it seems like that m those ones that are problematic might be a good one to ask them to go take out. The yeah, those would probably be the hardest for them to remove also, but we could ask. And they weren't honestly thrilled about it. They were like, maybe we could take a few. Right. Um, but we could definitely ask. And the two-part question, would those... I'd like to know which ones those are, and then where would they be? Um, would they be replaced with smaller palms, or would they just be taken out? Because if it's in a, I guess how many you said there's 33 all the way up and down. So um, that is just the foxtails. There's 33 doubles, six singles, where one of the doubles has died. Yeah. Um, others that have just died over time and should be noted, this is weird, but they're actually prone to some kind of a fungus mm -hmm. to where when it gets in the spores of the soil, you can't replace certain types of palms in that same spot. Um, and then there's um, a good handful of cabbage palms as well. Okay. Um, I just don't want to create like an inconsistent look where we're removing those yeah. five palm trees. So yeah. if they're you like, ideally they're, I, we don't, they're, we don't have a choice of which ones they are. But we I just don't want them to be like at an, if they're at an end cap or if they're in between two other palm trees, can we re replace them with yeah. something else or can the we? The removal process is more expensive when you do that just because you have to get like the full root system out. It's not just like a stump grinding. Yeah. But we can certainly remove them and replace them. Okay, I'd be curious to hear what the public thinks about that. So we'll ask when we get public comment. Um, does everyone? So I'll back up, too, because personally, so I live on Paradise Island, and I've, 
grown up there. My family's lived on Paradise Island since 1970. Um, I get the hesitation to remove the palm trees because they're they're the staple. It's what you have on the media in there. But if we delay this, we're just kicking the can down the road. If we're having to remove five of the 33 now, or call it 40, and we're going to have to remove more in five years, just delaying this problem for a future commission to have to go through the same agony and discussion in the public that we've gone through over the last several months. So I would personally prefer to see us, we've already allocated the money, I'd prefer us to see move forward with the landscape plan and we we engage the public as best as possible. I, I understand that it's 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 a difficult conversation to have and it's a, something that people are pushing back on on removing the palm trees, but I just I don't see it as a a decision we're making. We're we're just punting. We're just deciding to push this problem down the road, it's not, a, we're not coming up with a resolution. We already have a solution that's been pr provided to us. So that would be my first preference, but I understand if we're not comfortable in making that bold of a, a decision in the face of some feedback and criticism that we've received for the prospect of taking down those, those palms. I think we've put together a great packet of options and we voted on them and we had an engagement meeting that several people came to. Um, so if we don't do that, I mean, I'm okay with moving forward with just this simpler design of removing a couple. I just want to make sure that we we definitely need to improve the irrigation and we need to replace some grass because there's dead grass there too. There's also several palm trees that are dying mm -hmm. in areas that I believe were flooded during Hurricane Adalia and the other storm. Adalia in particular, we had a lot of water in the road on Paradise Boulevard and right in front of the Paradise Towers. And that's where a lot of the grass has died. But there's several palms there that are also turning brown on the front. So are those included in the ones that are going to be, those aren't necessarily the ones that are growing into the line. So are we going to remove those? Do we think that they're going to come back? Our grounds maintenance supervisor did recommend removing about the five that were going into the lines now and then about another nine that look unhealthy. So now we're we talking about 14. could have an artist come out and look and see if they believe that those might come back. My, my sense was that if, if you have palm trees there that are that have another five years of life in them and, and there's not an urgent need in terms of them interfering with the transmission lines that you that you not necessarily kick the uh, kick the bottle down the down the road you this is you still have five years of life left and it sounds like the the, the people that uh, live there enjoy those palms so I, I would keep them there until they uh, approached uh, becoming a problem. But now with that information, so if we have nine additional ones that are dying, which are, aren't necessarily overlapping with the ones going into the trees, we're looking at half of them that could potentially need to be taken out. I think it might be prudent to have an arborist look at them. Yeah. I don't know how much that costs, but. Yeah, so for the foxgloves, there's 39, um, so 14 out of the 39. Any thoughts, Commissioner from Paradise? Yes. <laughs> um, I uh, parrot what uh, Commissioner Dickey just said. Uh, I don't. Uh, I am not in favor of removing the palm trees if they've got another five years, maybe longer um, lifespan. Maybe it's going to be next year if we get another flooding and those trees happen just to come to um, the saltwater. Um, but I don't see the urgent need right now to go ahead full bore and then remove good trees. Um, take the ones out that are interfering with the, with the power lines that are burned uh, as we speak. Uh, if there's ones that have suffered from the saltwater intrusion um, and there's no chance to rehabilitate them, okay, and those can be removed. Um, but the ones that are alive and healthy, let them be alive and healthy. So do we just cut them down and not put anything back in their place? Or the ones that are, would that would would be removed? Mm -hmm. No, I mean if you're going to cut them down, I mean I think there's a couple alternatives. I was at that meeting where the presentation was made 
uh, by the arborist uh, as to what the um, potentials were for filling in if the trees were removed. And there's a listing in our packet here of the, uh, of the scorecard, so to speak. Um, and those are in there. Um, you know, there was a handful of people um, at the meeting, and so let's say there's uh, <laughs> let's say ten people were at the uh, at the presentation. Um, if we're going to let ten people dictate what yeah. goes in as the replacement, uh, we're falling back <coughs> in the same old trap that we do when that uh, handful of people dictate public policy. <coughs> um, that does I don't buy that. Um, so. Um, one of the alternatives that I hadn't seen considered is put put uh, foxtail palms in there that are only six feet high. And how many years do you buy? 15, 20? It would be fairly um, limited where you can place those with because without having eight feet of clear trunk, you run into issues with the visibility triangles or visibility corridors at the noses of all the medium. You'd just kind of be stuck with the center trunk. We're also then setting ourselves up for the same problem once those grow higher. Because well, then we're just kind of okay, then then put something in there different. That's different. That doesn't See, yeah, that's I I, I think concur with that. Yeah, the Christmas so palms seem to be. Do you know if Christmas palms are one of the species that can't survive in the area where those diseased ones have been? I don't think they can. I think they're kind of within that same family, but I, I will certainly have to get back to you. Okay. Do you guys have any thoughts? Um, whatever we do put in there, it does definitely need to be salt tolerant. Um, and a, maybe something nice that would bloom a little smaller tree, like a crepe myrtle or something of that sort. I believe they're pretty salt tolerant. Um, so that way, if, if we do have a tree that we have to going to last a while and not grow too tall and be able to do underneath the medium and then just replace them as we go with a certain, we can keep the original drawings and just replace them mm -hmm. if we have to. Yeah. And then we put forward those ones. Some of the palms are still good. Then we just kind of fill it in with things that are really I think that uh, uh, what Commissioner Dickey has said and Commissioner Minning has said it makes a lot of sense. And uh, that's <laughs> about all I have. Okay. Um, I would like to ask that before we like make a final decision that we see, and you, it doesn't, I don't need to do the go to the landscape architect or anything, but give me like in an Excel spreadsheet format or something like a map of where those palms are, where A, palms have already died mm -hmm. or been removed, like in each median, and which ones specifically are going to be removed, identifying the ones that are growing into the power lines and then also the ones that are diseased. Because I think once we have a visual, that will give us a better idea of if, if we need to replace them with something else or if they create, magically create their own little pattern that doesn't look terrible. Um, so I'd like to ask for that before we, I'm good with, it sounds like the consensus is to just leave them there, but I just want to, I think the next decision is do we replace them with something else? So I don't know that replacing them with a different type of palm tree is going to create a different aesthetic and a different look, very inconsistent, but maybe it won't. If I see that map, I might be able to digest that a little bit better. Um, let's hear, do we have any public comment on the Paradise Boulevard portion? <coughs> Go with Gary first and then Ray. Thank you. Gary Patenziano, 15 Treasure Lane. When we first embarked on this back in January, I said to myself, my God, we're doing a project right. We're going to have the people come in. We're going to take a look at it. We're going to develop a scorecard. We're going to come back and take a look at it. We haven't seen the scorecard. We haven't had a second meeting. And we fell back down on our, in, on our butts again doing the same thing, oh, this thing. We need to have a follow-up meeting with the residents. They owe, they deserve a meeting. No matter how many came, we deserve another meeting. And talk about this thing. 
everything you guys said is true, but we need to have them involved in this. Whether we go forward, we don't go forward, we keep what we have. Uh, what are we going to fill in? Because we haven't seen that. And I think you owe it to the residents, the commission, to hold that second meeting. So what scorecard are you well, referring we pick, to? We picked a couple. Uh, That's in the packet. <laughs> it's, meeting. it's on the website, too. I, well, I haven't seen it, so. I haven't seen it. We've looked. I haven't seen it anywhere. It's in the agenda it's packet for tonight's workshop. It has been. So it has it lists every species and it lists the total number of votes that each one of them received. Okay. Just to I I want you to have the opportunity to review it, but it is in the packet. Tenciano, I'm at 15 Treasure Lane Road. Um, we, I went to the meeting. There was probably ten of us, a lot of couples, so it was probably five of us that really were try to talk into the microphone. There were really five of us about this. Okay. Um, I have, we've owned this house since 2011. We've never lost power. We've had tons of flooding at our house. Okay, not in the inside, but we had water this high in our front yard in the back, okay? We um, have salt tolerant plants. We have palms, Christmas palms. Um, we didn't lose any of those, okay? So, but we used our sprinklers a lot. So we immediately put water on there to, you know, make the reactant change. They didn't do any of that on Paradise. And in the front there, I've had the county out a few times to try and address this, the mosquito problem that that barrier has had. And he told me, that is wrong. It's wrong the way it was put together. So we have a lot of standing water constantly there that high and then we have um, mosquitoes and you can ask all my neighbors it's horrible and it's because of that that was built right there and the county Pinellas has been out to spray and they've found beds in <coughs> places and they said they develop within a few days and I complained to the city they told me it wasn't worth my time and it was going to be seven days to two weeks before something like that would happen. The county doesn't believe that. So there's issues with that. And I think you guys need to address it. I don't think the trees need to be pulled out. I have We're, a I'm asked for public comment specifically on the Paradise Boulevard portion. Right. I'm going to come to the, okay. we haven't discussed the treasure land. I'll do the part. trees. The trees, I don't think, need to come out. I've never lost power since I've been there since 2011. Never lost power. Yes, there's a few trees that are in the lines, but they don't look dead to me. So why are we doing anything with them? If they come and top them, they top them, we fix them. We put one in and replace it. You know, if they're diseased, that's different. I had never heard there's been a diseased trees on those lanes. So that's the ones that have really already different. been removed where they're missing. Those were well, diseased. She said nine more. Yeah. Have to said unhealthy. Unhealthy. Okay. Well, I just, I don't agree with taking a, good palm out that's my thought okay? okay I just don't agree and I think we need to have more people come and talk about this instead of just making a decision on five couples or ten people that showed up and that's all that really came well we've tried I, I, know. <laughs> I know do you have any thoughts on replacing them the ones that are taken out should they be replaced with something else I know that Gary you're still the, the beautification person for the Civic right. Association. Right? Hey, hello, hello, there we go. Um, I agree with keeping the trees in. To replace them with what? I don't know that yet, Todd. Should we replace them with something, or should we? Oh, absolutely, and, and keep with the flow. I mean, you don't have, yeah, you don't have pull something out, and there's like, it's like, you know, when you look at somebody's mouth, and they have dental work, and they, have, they take the tooth out. Well, you don't want that to develop on there, so let's, let's, let's make it look nice. Okay. Ray, did you have something on the Paradise Boulevard part? While he's coming up, I just did want to say with regard to the voting, our staff did put door hangers and flyers in every single Paradise Island property, and we received all that feedback, and it's all tallied. So the people who wanted to have a say there did respond. All right, so these tallies also don't just include the people that came to the meeting. They also include people who emailed in their feedback as well. Okay, okay so I, I don't live in Paradise Island, obviously, but um, my, uh, my wife's uh, stepmother does. Lives across the street. I don't know if you knew that. Seven Island. 
Try to speak into them. Okay, sorry. And um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I really wanted to speak on this particular one because I like what I'm hearing, which is a, a common sense, logical approach that when one goes out, you can put it in. So I think the first step would be, what are we going to put back in there? And in my thought is, because I go up and down there a lot to go visit her and take care of her. She's getting, getting up there in age. And um, um, think about a, a palm that, that has a singular trunk just because of vision nothing else I I have Christmas palms they did not survive too well in the, when they got wet from the salt and I also have a foxtail terrible it just they died right away so just think carefully about that and I'm thinking something with a, a trunk that you can have good vision as you're going down the lane you got to turn or whatever it's hard to see people as well that's all I got thanks okay thank you yep you can come just come to the podium and state your name and address. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. My name is Petra Reese. I live at 8 Island Drive on Paradise Island. And um, I just wanted to um, also vo voice my opinion. Um, I guess I would want to offer two pieces of consideration. One is um, I also had a palm tree die because of the salt water. So I think 5 to 10% of regular replacement of, of palm trees in this salty environment are probably normal and just part of maintaining. Um, so taking some trees out and replacing them, I would, I would put forth might be just normal maintenance that needs to be expected uh, in this environment. And then the second consideration, um, kind of going back to what my neighbor here said um, about power outages, I just came down Park Street, uh, which you know all of the uh, power lines are covered in trees. And I think it's part of the appeal is of covering ugly power poles with trees is what makes the, the median really pretty. And I feel like there are probably, you know, if you drive through St. Pete, there's tons of neighborhoods where there's trees covering the lines, and if we haven't had large problems with power outages, then you know maybe we can um, think about how concerned we need to be about that. And I would just um, you know appreciate if you all took that into consideration. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So do we? Do you guys have a good guys on where to go with Paradise Boulevard? Have that map. Bring it back to another workshop and then we can kind of make a final decision. Does that sound good to the rest of the commission? Yes. Okay. Um, now on the Paradise Lane, Treasure Lane portion, um, this I think gets a little bit more complicated. So the current, your suggestion right now is to essentially do nothing, right? Um, so we do have that dollars in stormwater funds um, that was planned to go on Paradise Lane west of Paradise Boulevard to establish a similar drainage situation that we have on the other side. The water is there. Whether we want it in the roadway or want it on the side of the road is really the decision that we're looking at right now as a short-term fix with the money that we have available in the budget. That would require um, the removal of the bottle brush trees there because there's roots, um, big roots that are growing into that area, and that's also where the irrigation system is. So if you did want to reestablish that uh, drainage feature on that north side of the road, we would be removing the trees and um, replacing the irrigation system as well. So kind of a domino effect there. Um, if we wanted to look at pursuing other um, larger stormwater options that had a piped outfall where the water would not sit as long, um, we would um, plan to look at different project alternatives and come back to you during our budget process and talk about what that might look like. Um, so we could carry that money forward and save it at that time. Um, we don't want to wait too long before doing anything. That was designed to be a ditch, um, and it does undermine the base of the roadway on the edge um, when we allow water to continue to sit there. Okay. Um, sure. um, how is that tied on Treasure Lane? And Paradise Lane tied in with the um, elevate um, the I elevate the elevate the road. So as as the project stands right now, it doesn't tie in at all. Um, we are looking at a project that could be grant funded 
um, to elevate the West Causeway. Um, it would be re-landscaping the medians, the shoulder areas along the lanes, um, replacing the pavement all at one time. And then we would like to bring before you a second alternative that's a lesser project that basically um, provides a water quality component and then um, has an outfall similar to the situation that we've designed on the east side of the causeway. So you're not tying the two, you're not tying the two together? I'm not you sure what you mean. I elevate the causeway and the drainage? We would. That would be one alternative, a, a costly alternative that we would only pursue if grant funded, I believe. Okay. With um, another alternative that would cost us. So, one of, so in the watershed master or watershed management plan, and I think that's where which watershed management plan and elevate TI kind of go together. Yes. So w in the watershed management plan, it calls for the West Causeway to eventually be at 5.1 foot of elevation, right? Yes. And it's currently where? 3.45 on average. And that doesn't sound like a lot of difference, but when we're looking at like three inches, uh, shutting down a lane, it, it is a huge impact. So ultimately that would be the, to be in conformance with the with Elevate TI and the watershed management plan, it would need to come out up about a foot and a half. That doesn't necessarily need to be done all at the same time, is that a, so, so what you're saying is it would be a really, to get all the way there would be a very big project. So I would recommend doing that one all at once. Um, there's other areas in the city where you kind of have to do it incrementally because you have constraints of neighboring properties. That is one that would be obviously, like definitely the most cost effective to do it at one time because you can raise all your facilities at once. Okay. Um, so that kind of ties into this because if we're deciding what to do with landscaping on that road and that sort of a project is on the horizon, how far out do you think a project like that could be realistic? In mm -hmm. So one of the things that we wanted to develop for you after we got through the adoption of the Elevate TI terrain modification program was a decision matrix of, that would allow you to have a tool to decide how to use these funds um, there are arguably other areas in the city that have worse flooding now, but may not be able to get to that full elevation goal right now. Um, and there's different grant implications for different projects as well. So there's just a lot of factors for you to decide. So several years ago, when we first started looking at the adoption of the watershed management plan, the West Causeway was the top priority. Then there was discussion that that may shift to other areas. So it's a very big decision for you all to make. Um, in terms of planning, time-wise, it would depend on a grant. You wouldn't want to get too far into a design. You wouldn't want to get beyond conceptual without having a grant commitment. Um, and getting those grant funds, um, you, to put it this way, we still don't have the federal grant agreement for the master pump station that we were awarded quite a while ago. It just takes a long time. So three years, five years? I think, I think three to five is a good estimate. And, and it's not that we can't put other landscaping in. I, I just would be hesitant to put trees in. And I think those residents do want trees because they want that screening between their house and the roadway. But we would be putting ourselves in the same situation again, potentially five years from now, where we're looking at removing trees. And that's a very you know, heated subject. So that's the question I have for the commission is, with a project like that potentially out three to five years, or the other alternative was to do a a, a medium project mm. potentially next year where we would improve the... We could design next year. You're looking at two to three, so three to five years. Okay. So we're looking at either a full project to bring it all the way up to where the watershed mass management plan wants us to be or with three to five years or an intermediate plan that would come one to three years from now. Is, it, is there a return on investment in doing any sort of landscaping along the causeway now, the benefit being having better landscaping for that span of time, or do we leave it as is? We've heard from a lot of residents that the drainage is an issue, the water, you can see that the water there doesn't drain the same way that it does on the east causeway, which was just redone and a big project there to 
really have that done. That stays there probably like 24 to 36 hours, would you say, on the East Causeway? It, it's up to 72. Up to 72 yeah. on the East Causeway, too. Yeah. So that's how many days is that? Three days. Mm -hmm. um, so the life, according to CDC, the life cycle of a mosquito larva is like 11 days. It doesn't look pretty, though. Yeah. Um, and how long are we seeing water standing in the swales on the west causeway? I think the weekend that we had um, a couple of months ago where it rained all weekend long, was it two and a half inches, four and a half inches? So it was, it was about four days that the, we still saw water out there. But that was the most we've ever seen it. Yeah, it took longer than 72 hours, but it was not the whole next day. So it was like three and a half to four days at the most. And that was then... Now we have a raised water table. If you don't, you've lived out in um, Paradise Isles, uh, Paradise Island, and um, the water, there's a floating uh, brackish water table that goes up and down. So when the high tide goes up, guess what? That brackish water goes up also. And so we could have a, a king tide and there'd be water in the ditch, not from rain, but from the water table. The water table is. Uh, less than two and a half feet below grade out there on, on Paradise Island. Well, it, as you just noted, the water table fluctuates with the tide, also fluctuates with vegetation. Correct. Um, so, how much head do you have to work with? Oh. Well, between the the invert elevation on the ditch and the and the um, I'll call it the nearest one be the. There's okay, so on the there was no outfall from those ditches ever built, so there's no structure. What happens is, is once it fills up at both ends, it pops off, goes into the road, the treasure lane, and into our drainage there. I think I know the question that you're getting at, and that's it's not, nothing. That's not my question. It, it's 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 inch, it's fractions of inches, and so that's why. What we're going to find is when we look at this massive Elevate TI project and then we look at the cost to do the other piped one, it, it's, it's still going to be very expensive because we're looking at a very tricky piping situation that would be a narrow elliptical style pipe and trying to get that through existing easements to, to develop outfalls to drain those areas. It'll be, I'm excited to look at it because it's, it's an interesting alternative to look at, but it's probably not going to be an expensive, an well, inexpensive alternative. And I don't think it's the uh, be all end all. No. Because if you're already experiencing yeah. water in the ditch at a king tide, um, right. you don't have any head to work with. That's right. So, and I'd hate to see money spent on an expensive drainage uh, system when you're going to wind up the same as they do down Sunset Beach. I think our, our uh, options are, are somewhat limited um, yeah. in that regard. Any further thoughts? I still come back to my question is, if we have these two potential projects out a year and a half, or a year to two, a year to three years, or three to five years, is it worth doing anything with the landscaping along the causeway right now, or do we just leave it as is? And this is something that affects everyone, so I want to hear everyone's thoughts, because this is along the entryway to the city. Um, if you're looking at, as we just discussed, um, if you're going to redo the vegetation, just for vegetation's purpose, um, as uh, you mentioned, Patty, um, get something that's all tolerant. Um, because as you just discussed, when you get a king tide, you've already got it up to what, two and a half feet. So. When when a plant is is described as salt tolerant, all bets are off in inundation for days. Um, so we we definitely do our best to try to pick those, and that's what we've kind of identified in that species list are plants that are more salt tolerant. But it's just not a guarantee. Is there a problem with leaving the bottle brush there? I think it's the best short-term solution because I have heard from several of those residents and they really want trees. They want that screening from the road and I'm, I'm leery of putting trees in to take that back out. Yeah. 
Could we trim the bottle brush trees back any more than they are currently? Probably. Some of them are like growing into the road. Those, and like those bottle brushes, I believe, are about 40 years old. They normally last 25 years. I don't know. That's, why I'm, that's why I'm asking these yeah. questions. So, so those there, <coughs> how many bottle, bottle brushes, their, their root systems are very shallow. They don't go very deep. So their roots just go long and wide. And then they start to twist a little bit, right? Because you're now looking at those trees, and they're, you can see them twisting. So they're, they are, they're very old, and they're very brittle. And when we get a, a storm coming through and they break off big branches of it, that's what is causing us to have to push all that when we have a storm. If you were here during Irma, the bottle brushes are, were what prevented us from getting into the city because those bottle brushes broke. Their limbs broke and, and got in the way. So we had, it took us probably four hours or so to remove them. And that was just to push them off to the side of the road so we could get uh, emergency vehicles there. Those bottle brushes we had looked at by an arborist, I want to say right after that storm. And the arborist basically said, these are old, and they're they're not in really good shape. So we went through and and tagged which ones to remove. And as you remember, any of the branches that got broke, we cut the trees down because they were going to be brittle anyway. So the bottle brushes. Do you know are, how many of them have already been removed? Well, most of them were Estimate. removed on the east side, so they're all gone now. Yeah, the east. East the side east has side, mostly been removed. All of them have been removed. So east of Paradise Boulevard, light, like yes. between the par between the light and the drawbridge. East side, east side meaning. Just like in the after the storm, before we did the East Causeway project, we went through the east side and took them out. But on the west side, we primarily just removed the ones that were leaning really hard over. Like some of them were like almost at a ninety. Yeah. Really sideways. I know they've been removed from the East Causeway, yeah. but on the West Causeway, it's huh? been very selective. Okay. Yeah. Estimate on how many we've taken out, like 20? Maybe like 25 in each. And what sort of feedback have we received from, I know you just said from the people that live on those roads, they say they want trees eventually. And in the until they have different trees are they okay with the bottle brush trees I don't think so bottle because brush trees are better than this project originally came about because of a resident on Paradise Lane who went to the former city manager and said we need new landscaping and it is I mean we we hear that even from people who don't live on the lanes because they come in from the east side and it looks beautiful and then you come into ours it's like what's going on here um, so it's, it's a common thing that we hear like we need to do something to the area okay yeah, let's take some public comment. Thanks. Uh, Gary Potenziano, 15 Treasure Lane. Uh, the trees are in need of some TLC, no doubt about it, but it's better than nothing. And I don't want to see us throw money at something that's probably not worthwhile. Um, we haven't gotten many complaints on the Treasure Lane side about it, but more just the ditch. And even after the water, after the water dries up, it's muddy, it's junky. Cars run into it, it looks like a you know, racetrack through there. So that's the biggest issue. John, you know that. You see it all the time. So I, I, I don't know. It's not a simple answer. It is, it's, mysteriously, I can't say anything about it because some of the trees are bad, but we still need something that's better than nothing. Maybe a little trimming. Uh, there's a lot of utility boxes and power boxes that need to be fixed. It looks like they've been crushed, kicked, everything else. I try to fix them when I go by, but I can like so many things there. So maybe we take a little of that, and if we can plant some other plants around, I, I don't know what the answer is. It's definitely not spending good money after bad. Okay. Gary, yeah, if, if you would speak to uh, the project that we just did, uh, that would answer some questions for Gary and for Mr. <coughs> Tuning as well. And that, that project is the, uh, the two gentlemen that drove the city 
um, and took a look at all of the utility boxes of any sort of any company and uh, and basically now we're working with the the utility companies and everything else so I don't know if, if Mike you're best or yeah <clears throat> at, at your request through uh, the city manager we uh, did a survey of all the utility boxes and I'm when I'm saying boxes it's not the big transformers we're talking about the little smaller ones and most of them are uh, cable companies and so we went around and we basically tagged each one of those through G GIS so we have a map of where all those are located I am right now about at 50 out of 126 in the whole city, 50 of them identifying who they belong to. Now, I can't tell what cable company it is because they don't tell you. And if it's GTE, I don't even know if anybody has on it. So I'm going to go use to the cable companies. The, the electric company doesn't have much. From what I can see right now, the, the electric company does not have many boxes that are in dire need of being replaced at Duke Energy. However, there are probably a hundred or so of these other little bitty uh, boxes or cylinders with uh, cable um, connections in them. So my job is to figure out who, belong, who it belongs to and then I'm going to print it out and I'm going to send it to the cable companies and say fix or remove. So. There's 126 of them right now that we are sorting through and tagging who they belong to. And Ray, that was uh, like one of the issues that your wife had, and uh, and that's why I did bring it up to the city manager, and uh, and they they moved on it pretty quickly. <laughs> um, okay. Do we have any other public comment on this? I have a little the causeway so you received my stuff on the on the causeway and in particular the south side where the water stands um, so at some point uh, I don't know when it was a year or two ago uh, you guys dug that ditch deeper and it and I think the problem's gotten worse to be honest with you and if you look at the tire uh, marks I think there's a big safety issue a huge safety issue um, uh, every time the water goes up on the street, you can, when it recedes, and I, I heard what he said, but I can tell you I've been monitoring the water in that ditch as well, and it's been about five days it sits in that thing at times. And even after it's gone, there's a certain layer of mud and muck at the bottom of it. And you can see the tire tracks where they're going off the, off the uh, road. There's no shoulder anymore um, because the way it was cut last time, it goes at an angle, so it should have stayed flat for a while, and actually it probably should be paved. But um, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, Mayor, in that if this is a one to th three year project, well, that's one thing. But if it's three to five, and three to, three to five could turn to be you know, four to six or five to seven, then I think we'd be going in the wrong direction. I think the fix for that ditch there is pretty simple. I sent some sketches to you guys to consider and um, you could fix that side the other side has a similar but it does have some drains you have to you have to look for them but there, there are some drains there and um and it's and when it backs up it's not nearly as bad so um i was asked by a friend of mine to relay and I, you should do some more work and talking to the people who live on paradise lane and and, and uh, treasure lane i don't live live there but there's a lot of people don't want those trees anymore. They're old, they, they're messy, um, they keep breaking off. And um, and I think if you do whatever you're gonna do closer to either Paradise or Treasure Lane um, and and leave more room in, on, the, on the side of the causeway, then you can probably get some short-term ditching going in there, try to relieve this, this safety issue. And the one on the southwest um, really, really needs um, needs some sort of an outfall. So, uh, I think if you dug the ditch properly, you put in the right uh, drainage to handle your first flush, one inch rainfall, and um, and did it correctly, like I had showed. You could push a pipe, and you could probably make that work. 
to invert high in that particular area, and it, I think it'll work just fine. Again, if you're thinking something in one to three years, I might feel differently about it, but you do have a safety issue, and you should address it. And, you, and, and, and you know, you, we don't want to see anybody, you know, even if they're on the phone doing something stupid, but go into that ditch and, and hurt themselves or, or, you know, hurt somebody. So, um, so how do we resolve the safety issue, though? I'm not, I'm confused at how. Instead of you having a, a deep ditch, mm -hmm. You have a shallower ditch, and you put a, a much more permeable rock, uh, like Macaferry gabions and stuff like that, with an embedded pipe in it, and so it's flatter, and so it's not going to the car's not going to be driven down into that, and put more of a shoulder. So because when you, when it rains, you can't see that shoulder anymore, and it doesn't. You know, people are pretty much going blindly, so they they slow down for the most part. But if you're next to somebody, you you don't know where you're at. And and, and y'all, you don't have to look at any further than the fact of looking at the ditch after the rain, and you can see tire yeah. tracks in it. They're there. I, and I saw one. It was a bicycle. I don't know what happened there. I mean, I don't know if they lost control and got into the ditch, and then you can see the foot marks where they had to, you know, walk their bike out. So it is a safety issue, and it is the entryway into Treasure Island. And so I think that is one that should look really nice. My opinion. The aesthetic issue, it is an issue, but the water's either on the road or it's off the road. So there's a safety issue regardless of where it came. Yeah, unless the whole soil and side of the road is reconstructed, right? Unless you add awful. And can that be, could that be done like he's suggesting, is adding outfalls as it stands right now? That's the project alternative that we went through before you could touch it. As opposed to elevated. Okay. Um, last question. So just kind of coming back to the my question of is it worth doing any landscaping there now and utilizing some of the budget that we have to respond to these residents that are asking for some improvement? There are a lot of areas where those bottle brushes have already been taken out and there's nothing there. We did a really great job, I think, on the north side of the road coming right out right as you come over the drawbridge where we there was an issue of the people all the way down at the end of the road we think kind of cutting over to get out quicker um, and we added like fountain grass kind of in an s shape would that be an option to add periodically down the causeway to beautify a little bit in areas where the bottle brush have been removed certainly put more grass between the trees that are there, yeah. Would that be something that we would, if it's a one to three, if it's one to three years until we do something there, I know that that would eventually get potentially taken out, but to, and I need to lay fresh eyes on how much there is that I would, we would want that in, but any thoughts on that? Um, if you were to take the bottle bush trees out and just put in the grass like is on the north side, just immediately west of the bridge, um, you lose all your. There's no visual um, barrier. Yeah, I'm not take. I'm not suggesting taking the. I'm saying if we leave all the bottle brushes as is, there are still a lot of open spaces where they've already been removed. So could we add in some landscaping in the meantime, where those bottle brushes, where there are big voids of any sort of landscape. I would think if you're going to fill in, fill in with something that can be a visual barrier. Which would be more expensive, though, well, and would potentially need to be taken out later on if there's a bigger project. We don't know. And so if you want to go down that path, let's go down that path and find out what trees are there, how much would it cost, what are the alternatives for filling in, and take it from there, see what the costs are. Talk into your microphone. Sorry. I'm used to our old mics that actually picked up the sound. Um, but um, there's some spots that look just terrible along the causeway, and it's our entrance to the city. 
And I think we really do need to do a, a cost analysis of what we're looking at and what we can put in. That's what I'm suggesting is in the areas where they've already been taken out and it looks bare, could we add something just until we have a bigger project exactly. to beautify it a little bit? I don't think it would cost that much, so maybe that's something we could look into. Would that be okay with at least getting some costs? Is that with no trees? Not taking out any trees, but filling in where, and I can work with you to kind of identify some of those yep. spaces, um, but just trying to beautify it a little bit rather than having those voids. Yeah, I'm, I'm, good. I'm good with that. So. All right, any other comments? Is that sufficient for now? Okay. It doesn't solve your the ditch issue in the meantime, but I think we got to see what they come up with as far as a design and find out how much that's going to cost and evaluate whether we want to move forward with that or the like ultimate goal. I'm speaking for another person that I talked sure. to just couldn't be here tonight. Um, would you object to maybe if there one of the um, homeowners there that had one of those trees in front that they are the ones that have to deal with it all the time and looking at it, would you be opposed to pulling one for one of those particular people that wanted it pulled? You're going to have to pull these trees eventually, right? So, something to consider. Anyone want to respond to that? Uh, I, I think it's worth us having a field trip out there uh, as a group and meeting with some of the residents there as well as a couple of experts that might be able to tell us what our options are, uh, both short-term and long-term. Unfortunately, we we'd have to formalize it. We could do that, uh, but we'd have to formalize it and have to be a, a noticed meeting that the public would uh, would be able to attend. It's, it's doable. Uh, it just, it's little bit more of a logistical, but we, it can be done. Is that something we want to do, or do we want to just rely on, we can probably rely on some, could we get some drone pictures from out there that we could look at, and some ground level pictures, Google, we have great. We have Google Earth. Earth is your best bet. Well, it's not current. It's a, within nine months, usually. Yeah, it's a lot changes in nine months. I believe Jason. Jason can do it for us. Then we at least have some visuals to kind of base off of. And I can, we can, I can work with Stacy. We can, or, go or we can go out there individually, so yeah. we don't have yeah. to deal with those issues. But but somebody's going to have to point us in the right direction because uh, I'm not sure. that familiar with with uh, some of the areas that you're talking about. I don't okay. want to say areas. I mean specifics. <laughs> I'll make. I'll, we'll, we'll. I'll be there tomorrow. All right. Sounds good. This sounds like a good direction to everyone? Yeah. All right. All righty. Um, we'll move on. Do we have any other public comment on any, any other topics? All right. Hearing none, we'll adjourn. Thank you, everyone.